Next, um, our next speaker has been a friend of mine for a long time. We've been working together and over in England for quite a while, and he is native to England. I'll not tell what somebody said yesterday when they were looking for him. He said, where is that Irishman? And they, I just about ran. I knew he would appear all of a sudden. <laughs> but, of course, if Joe Daly is listening to this, I can't say too much. <laughs> but Joe Daly is an Irishman. He's a very good, fine, upstanding, faithful member of the church who lives in Birmingham, England, and we've known him for a long time. But Ken is a faithful gospel preacher. He works with the church presently in Belvedere, um, the Belvedere Church of Christ, which is um, in that part of uh, South Carolina. Can you get South Carolina out? In 1969, he made his first trip to the United States, and there he met his wife. She's the native Texan, Linda. And then they went to England the summer of 1970. Uh, and they were married in Aylesbury on June 20, 1970. They have three children. And um, how many grandchildren? Seven. Seven, Seven grandchildren. Uh, he's preached in a number of states and in Canada. Uh, he did what a lot of people won't do long ago when he was a much younger man. As a member of the Christian church, he loved the truth enough. When he heard the truth, he gave up that and came to the truth of the gospel regarding what the Lord's church actually is. He makes mission trips to England every year. He goes again less than two weeks. And then we'll be together, Lord willing, in October in the English lectures. So he does a great work. Now, his uh, subject of the morning is agnosticism. Can we know anything? Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this because I want to know if we can. And don't get a hold of Terry. He'll tell you more than you want to know. But uh, anyway, uh, that's what we're going to hear. Now, I, I'm going to give him a little license here. He wants to make a, a bit of a report on Sister Joan Moulton and some of the work over there. And so before I start his time, don't you preachers all get beside yourselves. Because besides that, we've got the dub Sunday morning wanting more time. Ken pressing his luck, and I was really afraid, buddy, because you have Ken's reputation at spring, that you were going to let him get by and he'd be preaching now. <laughs> because one night, I'm telling you, and he owes the record. Brother Ed Rutland is not a member anymore, but they've been here. He was in the audience, too, and I was thinking, they're both of the men that hold the record of speaking so long on Wednesday night there was no time for classes. <laughs> Ken holds the record on that, though, I think. So I was afraid of that a while ago. So you've got a little time, but then I'll start your time. Okay, come on up and speak to us, please. It's really good to be here again. I appreciate the invitation to be here from the elders and David. And uh, it's good to be able to be here and certainly appreciate the hospitality of Kenneth and Nancy. I find it interesting, though, that uh, Michael and I are the ones that were chosen to uh, be speaking at the hour when the ladies uh, are not with us. So I don't know what that uh, implies. <laughs> but about this time next week, I should be in Cambridgeshire somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where I'll be at this time in the mid-afternoon period. But I should, Lord willing, be there doing beginning cleanup operations after Danny Douglas returned uh, from his trip over there. And uh, I hear he has a problem understanding what red lights are when you come to junctions. But I will say this. We really appreciate the work that Danny did while he was over there. I've got many good reports. And what I'd like to do is to encourage any of you that can find some time to go over, to spend some time working with these brethren that we have associated with, uh, to encourage them and to help them along the way. And I say this particularly in the light of the situation that 12 months ago, or just a little bit uh, less than 12 months ago, be 12 months ago this coming weekend, Graham Moulton, who had been a faithful worker in England for many years, was found collapsed at the house on the Saturday uh, when I left on the Monday to go to England, which was the Monday after the lectureship. Uh, he was in surgery, and we weren't sure whether he was even going to survive surgery. 
where he was survived surgery. They found he had an operable brain tumor, and they gave him six to nine months. I was in a meeting in Dresden where Danny was preaching and had to leave right in the middle of the uh, the gospel meeting because Brother Moulton passed away the first part of June. He had been the mainstay of the work in Mildenhall, and since then one of the brethren who is uh, over there with his wife, who is military, uh, has been doing much of the preaching. And I know they really appreciated Danny being over there to help, and that's one of the things that we need to, to encourage. And also, uh, update on Joan and the, the girls. They're doing well. She has found a part-time job, but she's looking at something else that may be more suited to her. But they're, they're doing well. They're in good spirits, and our constant battle over Birmingham and Coventry, for anybody listening on the Internet, still goes strong. Last weekend, I was able to inform her that my hometown team beat her hometown team in real football. But that's a common thing that's gone on for many years that I've known the Maltons. So I'd encourage you to uh, keep them in your prayers and also keep uh, my wife in your prayers as I will be leaving. As you know, my wife has leukemia. She's undergoing cancer, uh, chemotherapy treatment for that. I got a good report this past week after my little episode last year, and I still only have one kidney, but everything else seems to be functioning correctly. So right now we're, I'm doing fine, but would continue to appreciate your prayers for, for her. Mentioning Danny Douglas, uh, as I was preparing this material, he called on the phone one day and asked, Ken, what's your subject for this year? And I glibly responded, I don't know and I don't care. Well, agnosticism indicates that one does not have enough knowledge to determine whether or not God exists. And in some instances, there are those who hold that position that really truly don't care about it at all. But there are those that do care in the sense that they really believe that. But the situation is, the truth of the matter is that they will not accept the evidence that would be to the contrary of their preconceived notions and their pre preconceived ideas. And that's well illustrated, I believe. You'll see the illustration if you look at the manuscript of a new advertisement that's going out on the buses. That's one way the bus companies make money in England is providing advertising specs. And on the side of the bus there is the sign, there is probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. A headline from an article which was reporting this new advertising campaign said, All aboard the atheist bus campaign. It followed by the statement, It's real. It's happening. You can sponsor the first atheist advert on a bus. And Richard Dawkins will match your money. Now Richard Dawkins is a Bridget ethologist, evolutionary biologist, and popular science and writer and professor at Oxford University. He's a prominent critic of creationism and intelligent design, claiming to be an atheist. But note the thrust of the act. There is probably no God. He claims uncertainty with respect to knowing whether there is a God and then promotes a lifestyle that would ignore the existence of God. Well, as we begin our study this morning, we need firstly to define the meaning of agnosticism and of agnostic, the one who would hold to the tenets of agnosticism. The word is one that was coined back in 1869 by Thomas Henry Huxley, the noted English biologist. Though the date is known, the specific background that Huxley had in mind when he coined the word has been the cause of debate for many years, but uh, he defines it in his own way as to his background to it. But let's look at the dictionary definition just quickly. Miriam Webster on their online dictionary designs, an agnostic is a person who holds the view that any ultimate reality as God is unknown and probably unknowable. 
and thus, broadly speaking, one who is not committed to believing in either the existence or non-existence of God or a God. Sometimes it also is used for the person unwilling to commit to an opinion about something. An example, political agnostics. And also, in the free dictionary says agnosticism is a form of skepticism that holds that the existence of God cannot be logically proved or disproved. And then they give some prominent uh, agnostics. The term actually comes from a background of the Greek agnostos meaning unknown or unknowable. Huxley said he took the word from Paul's statement in Acts 17.23 where he mentions the unknown God and the word is formed simply by adding the A to the word gnosis. Gnosis being the idea of knowledge. So, no knowledge. Unknown, unknowable. It implies agnosticism and certainty about whether God actually exists. And one who holds to these views is one who is undecided as to whether God exists or does not exist, as opposed to one who calls himself an atheist who believes that he knows for certain that God doesn't exist. I want to note some other source here from a website that makes this statement. An agnostic is someone who not only is undecided concerning the existence of God, but who also thinks that the question of God's existence is, is in principle unanswerable. We cannot know whether or not God exists according to an agnostic and should therefore neither believe nor disbelieve in him. God probably doesn't exist, so, you know, just live your life regardless, as the bus ad says. The basic problem being that there are many answers that can be given to the question, does God exist, at least from the agnostic viewpoint. He might say, well, I don't personally know, or I don't know, but will lead my life and the assumption that God does not exist. Or I don't know, but will lead my life assuming that God does exist. I cannot give an opinion because there's no way that we can prove the non-existence of God given our currently available knowledge. Or I cannot give an opinion because there's no way, no way to know with certainty whether anything about God now and in the future. Some might say, yes, God exists, but I don't know anything about God at this time. We have no possibility of knowing anything about God, now or in the future. The one principle links all of these things, the meaning of agnostic, is that God's existence, they say, can neither be proved nor disproved according to current available knowledge. And thus they claim the question concerning the existence of God is open, pending more evidence becoming available. But what do they want for evidence? that's not already available. They also claim that they are willing to change their belief should solid evidence or logical proof be found in the future. Someone says, well, how many agnostics are there? Well, the Religious Tolerance website says the numbers are known. Most data sources lump together agnostics, atheists, free thinkers, persons of no religion, and skeptics. Some agnostics identify themselves as humanists, Unitarian Universalists, or ethical culturalists. One estimate that they quote says that there are 991,000 American adults who will identify themselves as agnostics, about 0.5% of the total population. They do say that there are more self-identified agnostics than atheists, I mean, because there are a number of people that really aren't willing to make a commitment. And there's a lot of people that don't want to make a commitment about anything, so that's probably why they say they were agnostic rather than atheist. Well, so you have all of this going on, but unfortunately all public opinion and surveys of religious affiliation they state include a significant percentage of individuals who do not reveal their religion. In the case of one study, it amounted to about 7% of the total. And so they say we suspect many of them are also agnostics. 
They're not going to say what they believe. We'll, we'll count them in the group because we're really not sure about anything. Well, what about some famous agnostics just briefly here? Well, I just want to note a few quotations. There'll be more that will be in the book than I will be able to quote because of time. One of these, of course, is a gentleman that's well-known who's been celebrated this year, celebrated for the 200th year of his birth and 150th anniversary of the publication of his book, The Origin of Species. That is Charles Darwin. He said, while my own views may be at what may be is a question of no consequence to anyone but myself. But as you ask, I may state that my judgment often fluctuates. In my most extreme fluctuations, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. I think that generally, and more and more as I grow older, but not always, that an agnostic would be the more correct description of my state of mind. It's imp impossible to answer your question briefly, and I'm not sure that I could do so even if I wrote at some length. But I may say that the impossibility of conceiving that this grand and wonderful, wondrous universe with our conscious self arose through chance seems to me the chief argument for the existence of God. But whether this argument is of real value, I've never been able to decide. I am aware that if we admit a first course, the mind still craves to know where it came and how it arose. Nor can I overlook the difficulty from the immense amount of suffering throughout the world. I am also induced to refer to a certain extent to the judgment of the many able men who have fully believed in God, but here again I see how poor an argument this is. The safest conclusion seems to me that the whole subject is beyond the scope of man's intellect. The man can do his duty. Huxley, that we mentioned before, made this statement as quoted in Infidel's Dot or. He said, when I reached the intellectual maturity and began to ask myself whether I was an atheist, a theist, or pantheist, a materialist, or an idealist, a Christian, or a free, free thinker, I found the more I learned and reflected, the less ready was the answer, until at last I came to the conclusion that I had neither art nor part with any of these denominations except the last. The one thing in which most of these good people were agreed was the one thing in which I differed from them. They were quite sure they had attained certain notices had more or less successfully solved the problem of existence. Well, I was quite sure that I had not, and I had a pretty strong conviction that the problem of existence, that, 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 that I, had, was, I had a pretty strong conviction that the problem was insoluble. This was my situation when I had the good fortune to find a place among the members of that remarkably, remarkable confraternity of ag antagonists long since deceased, but of green and pious men me memory, the metaphysical society. And he goes on then to, to say how he labeled himself then as an agnostic, as we saw the term earlier. Robert Ingersoll, perhaps the most famous American agnostic of the 19th century, wrote that I asked myself the question, is there a supernatural power, an arbitrary mind, an enthroned God, the supreme will that sways the tides and currents of the world to which all causes know? I do not deny. I do not know. But I do not believe. I believe that the nature natural is supreme, that from the infinite chain no link can be lost or broken, that there is no supernatural power that can answer prayer, no power that can wor worship can persuade or change, no power that cares for man. I believe that with infinite arms nature embraces the all, that there is no interface, no chance, that behind every event all are the necessary and countless causes and that beyond every event will be and must be the necessity and countless effects. Is there a God? I do not know. Is man immortal? I do not know. One thing I do know, and that is that neither hope nor fear, belief nor denial can change the fact. It is as it is, and it will be as it must be. We wait and hope. Perhaps the best known 20th century agnostic was Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher. And in 1939, he gave a lecture on the existence and nature of God, in which he characterized himself as agnostic. He said, the existence and nature of God is a subject which, of which I can discuss only half. If one arrives at a negative conclusion concerning the first part of the question, the second part of the question does not arise, 
and my position, as you may have gathered, is negative one on this matter. But later in the same lecture, discussing the modern non-anthropomorphic concepts of God, he states, that sort of God is, I think, what, not one that can actually be disproved, as I think the omnipotent and benevolent creator can. I want to get a little bit specific here concerning this idea of agnosticism as it relates to the Lord's Church. That there are those within the body of Christ who claim they cannot know the existence of God. In an article called The Moral Argument in the bulletin of uh, the church where he was working, Floyd Johnson made these comments in November of that year. It should be apparent by now that the existence of God, as well as the non-existence of God, cannot be proved in a final, absolute sense. But you know, Brother Johnson is not alone. Back in 1974, Brother Roy Deaver, that David mentioned a little while ago, wrote an article in which he made some quotes from Brevler, although he does not name them in the article. He wrote, it is tragic indeed that there are certain brethren among us who are likewise teaching the doctrine that it is impossible for us to know that God is and that the Bible is the word of God. Consider the following. Yes, but we cannot know that God exists. There's no way to prove that God exists. We are compelled, compelled to accept the idea of the existence of God by faith. Another of these arguments take you down to this point. But from there on, you have to proceed upon the basis of faith. There is no way to really know. Another half faith of any sort is based on probability. Absolute certainty is only a theological concept. Again, the man of faith behaves as if he knew. All persons live their lives by proceeding on faith, which amounts to what they consider as a high degree of probability. As indicated earlier, there is not enough evidence anywhere to absolutely prove God, but there is adequate evidence to justify the assumption or the faith that God exists. And another, this choice or commitment is in the realm of the subjective, to be sure, since it transcends the objective and, which, and what can be clearly proved and thus is a leap of faith. There are some others, but I will leave it at this point except to mention that but the diva says there is one other writer that speaks of this. And I found that writer. And I found that quotation that he had reference to. Brother J.D. Thomas, in his book, he makes this statement. In the closing portion of chapter 14, we noted a distinction between the two realms of reality. That of physical things where the realities can be touched, weighed, measured, and divided. And the metaphysical realm, where the realities are mental or spiritual and do not yield to scientific analysis. Religious faith required that one accept the existence of metaphysical realities, those which lie beyond or behind the physical realm. The believer must accept the possibility of true and false statements being made about the existence of such metaphysical realities, even though they are scientifically non-verifiable. He continues, Total knowledge, then, for the man who seeks full religious truth will include truth in the realm of physical, material things, but also in the realm of non-physical things. It covers the ground of both physics and metaphysical. Knowledge is the physical realm can be derived from science with the use of sci the scientific method of investigation and research. In this realm, we can determine certain knowledge in the sense that it can be tested and verified. Absolute certainty, however, is impossible in the metaphysical realm. So that there is some degree of, of verifiability which can result in a high degree of probability. And again, if Christianity and all its demands could be proved, there would be no need for faith. But there's another writer that took a similar position to J.D. Thomas. And that's Basil Baxter, who for many years was the speaker on the Herald of Truth program. 
Let's note a couple of quotations from him. Either there is a God or there is not. There can be no in-between. If the evidence supporting the idea of the existence of God is more convincing than the evidence that raises questions and problems about his existence, then the fair-minded reasoner must decide for faith in God. All that is required is that faith be demonstrated to be more reasonable than non-faith. And again, he quotes, in, quoting from him, in these situations where it is not possible to know complete and absolute truth, in those situations which involve faith, it is better to take the path of hope than the path of fear. After all, what have we to lose when we add to this the impressive evidence reviewed in the, this book, touching all phases of the Christian view of life? Faith and hope are more reasonable choices than doubt or despair. You know, about ten years after Roy Deaver's article, which I quoted from before, another article was written and published in the same Gospel Advocate where Roy Deaver's article had appeared, written by Hugo McCall, entitled Faith and Knowledge, that clearly takes an opposite stance to that article written by Brother Deaver. In his article, McCord states, some are bold to assert that theism is not, the, not only the most probable explanation of the universe, but that it cannot possibly be wrong. Now the thesis of Bud McCord's article has been well refuted by Gary Grizel, and I quote the source of that response, which is available online, and I would recommend folks take the opportunity to look at that response and the article that Brother McCord presented. I also understand that he presented some of the same ideas at Memphis in 1984 at the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship. But can we know that God exists? Or is agnosticism correct? Are agnostics, whether they be in or out of the church, correct when they state that we cannot know that God exists? Also, can we know that the Word of God is the Bible? Or the Bible is the Word of God? I believe that we can certainly can know that God exists and the Bible is his word. As we've seen in some of the quotes that we mentioned previously, some would indicate that we can only have faith that God exists and that the Bible is his word. But such thinking comes about because I believe of a misunderstanding of the relationship between faith and knowledge. Well, what connection is there between faith and knowledge? Is there one? Can someone both know and have faith at the same time, or must it be an either-or proposition? <clears throat> there are some that would suggest that having faith automatically rules out the possession of knowledge. Such is common amongst many religionists and sadly amongst many brethren also. What is the truth of the matter? Do biblical faith and knowledge coexist, or must they be viewed as one being the antithesis of the other? That faith against knowledge or knowledge against faith is indeed false. For they are not diametrically opposed or mutually exclusive. The truth of the matter is that faith is dependent upon knowledge. You know, our Lord himself made it very clear in his assessment of the part that knowledge plays in bringing about faith. John 8, 32, he said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If knowledge relates to truth, then faith relates no less to him who is the truth, John 14 and 6. Both knowledge, John 7, 17, and faith, John 16, 27 through 30, recognize both the Lord and his teaching are indeed from God the Father. Peter tells us, tells us of his desire that Christians grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. The Apostle Paul wrote of his desire for the child of God that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Colossians 1.9. Paul also tells us what the desire of God is, 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Apostle John repeatedly makes it clear 
But not only can men know the truth, but that they can know that they know the truth. He stated that we can know the truth, that we can know that we know it, 1 John 2, 21. And that we can know that we know Jesus and know that we are in him as we keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Knowing doesn't rule out faith, and faith does not rule out knowledge. In Scripture, faith and knowledge are never set forth as being one in contradistinction to the other. At times, faith may be contrasted with a means whereby knowledge can be attained, such as science, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But faith is never contrasted with knowledge or even reason. Furthermore, there are times when faith and knowledge may have the same object. The Word of God makes it clear that the following can be both known and believed concerning God, the truth, the deity of Christ, etc. We might also add that knowledge always precedes faith, and where there is no knowledge, there can be no biblical faith. In that article that we quoted before from Roy Deaver, I want to just quote a few thoughts from him at this point. More will be in the manuscript. Can we know that God exists? Can we know that the Bible is the Word of God? The basic question underlying these questions is, can we know anything at all? If it is possible for us to know anything, it is possible for us to know that God exists. Can we know anything? Is the normal human being capable of really knowing anything? To answer this question, we must come to a knowledge of what knowing means. Interesting sidelight. It is possible for one to come to a knowledge of what knowing really means? Would it be possible for one to know that it is impossible to know? He continues, The empirical philosophers insist that the only real knowledge is that which comes by means of the physical senses. The existential philosophers insist that there is no way that one can really know anything. We are insisting at this point that though it is certainly true that there is knowledge which comes by means of the physical senses, it is also true that there is knowledge which comes by means of contemplation. We are insisting that it is possible for one to know and to know that he knows by working in thought according to the demands of the principles of correct reasoning. And again, the law of rationality holds that we ought to justify our conclusions by adequate evidence. Adequate evidence dem absolutely demands certain conclusions. We're not talking about assumptions. We're not talking about guesses or speculations or probabilities or possibilities. We are speaking of that conclusion which is absolutely demanded by the evidence at hand. And that conclusion which is demanded by the evidence is a matter of knowledge. It is knowledge just as much as is the case with regard to the sense perceptions. But it even stated that these things concerning the meaning of knowledge and the evidence that we can know so very clearly. Can God's existence be proven? Can we know that God exists? As Brother Diva clearly showed, the answer is a resounding yes. The psalmist said, be still and know that I am God, Psalm 46 and verse 10. Bible teaching is indeed plain. For they declared, declared emphatically, we can know indeed must know God. Our Lord himself had no doubt that we can and must know God. He said, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. He said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself, John 7, 17. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Luke records, under inspiration, it seemed good to me also having the perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Peter declared, uh, and we have believed and know that thou art the Holy One of God, John 6, 69, according to the American standard. Again, what is recorded concerning what the Samaritans said to the woman? What did they say to her? Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Not we think. We know. John 4, 42. But again, the Apostle Paul, we have these words to the Corinthians, brethren. And 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and then 6 through 8. 
For we know that if we are earthly hath and this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and hath not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Later writing to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 1.12, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know who I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed against him, unto him against that day. Those who would insist we cannot know need to study well the writings of the Apostle of Love, John, particularly from his first epistle. First John 2, 3, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He said, I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. First John 2, 13 through 14. And again in verse 29 of chapter 2. If ye know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. In fact, in his first epistle, John uses in some form the word no some 24 times. The agnostic maintains the evidence is not there, whereby one can know that God exists. But I believe we have shown that the existence of God is both knowable and provable. And brethren who would teach that the existence of God is not knowable are to that extent, agnostic in their thinking. The very Bible that they preach teaches that one can know that God exists. To state that we cannot know is therefore a falsehood. I want to conclude with some words from the pen of Brother Tom Warren, a man who did much in his lifetime to convince atheists and agnostics of the truth. Note what he said. We can know that God exists. We can know that the Bible is the Word of God. We can know what the Bible teaches as to what man must do to become a child of God. We can know what a man must do in order to live acceptably as a child of God. We can know that all who reject the gospel will be lost. We can know that men who enter into religious denominations sin in so doing. We can know that those who use instrumental music in worship in God sin in so doing. Just recently, as a result of an article that we put in the local paper in our weekly teaching article, an article in which we're dealing with the matter of abortion because it was the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, I made a little notation at the bottom concerning homosexuality and as a result received a response from an individual that has continued to come forth. And I want to just denote a few things from that because this shows his agnostic thinking when it comes to the Word of God. Just in, by way of uh, introduction, in his first uh, email, he said, I am pro-life and pro-gay. These issues go hand in hand and both are in line with Christ's teaching. This I, these, this I these believe but will also agree to disagree. However, I do wish outspoken religious leaders would refocus some of their misguided priorities to true social ills, such as abortion, poverty, and the current health crisis, rather than against the LGBT persons. In another email, he states, the moral issue on homosexuality, I'm sure, will be debated for a long time. I read your February 4th article, that's one in which I responded in the same way as I'd responded to, to his email, I put some of that stuff in the following week's article. In how you cite one quote and then offer your interpretation. He said, there are some that choose to interpret these scriptures as you do, and also many that do not. That is, that is why there are over a thousand different Christian churches, all with their own interpretation of the Bible. Many claiming that theirs is the genuine religion and the only true path to salvation. He said, I choose to be more ecumenical. Now what he stated there, as I pointed out to him in reply, that what he said is an indictment against God. 
God couldn't know what to say in order to be able to make his word clear. The truth of the matter is that men have decided they wanted to have it different to what God has to say. He said also in another email, God gave us the gift of reason to parse out the truth. And although all paths are through God to heaven, each of us is an individual and we each have different callings. So the path for one person may be a little different than the next. And then he says, I totally agree with you that we cannot have a la carte, an a la carte approach to morality. There are fundamentally truths out there. That is why we need religious leaders and the Bible to guide us. I stated the point that there exist a thousand versions of Christianity, just simply that so many are striving to make a literal translation of the Bible, but each are reading and interpreting using uh, human error, phone eyes and brains. One should constantly strive to sit back and think what part of mean is causing me to read the Bible this way. What part of me, I suppose he meant. Am I letting some emotions or bias cloud my judgment? But you see what he says there? We can't really know. The Bible doesn't give us the evidence that we need. So I really don't know whether you're right or I'm right, but let's all agree and get along together. In the course of one of his emails, he talked about, you know, uh, what Leviticus had to say about eating pork. He didn't want to say anything about what it had to say about homosexuality. But he said, do you speak about eating pork? And I, if you've seen the bulletin, I wrote an article about eggs and bacon for breakfast. He has no concept of the dividing of Scripture, rightly dividing the Word of God. But it's the idea where you can go your way and you can go mine, which again verges on uh, agnosticism. The time is about up. I want to just mention something else briefly that is in the manuscript. I want to quote again. I want to add something to what Brother Thomas Warren said. He didn't mention this, but I believe it exists right along with the quotation that we quoted just before we went to this uh, individual's concerns about homosexuality. He said, I want to add from what Brother Warren stated, we can know who we are to fellowship and who we are not to fellowship. Amen. For there are those who would contend that such is beyond a man's powers to know in spite of what John states. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, we can know those things. If there come any in Judah, bring not this doctrine, what does he tell us? He tells us we are neither to bid him Godspeed, because if we bid him Godspeed, we are partake of his evil deeds, 2 John 9 through 11. Clear implication from this passage is that we can know those we must not fellowship. We cannot know the doctrine of Christ, we cannot know what is not the doctrine of Christ. That be so, we cannot determine those to whom we should not bid God's speed. And I mentioned in the manuscript about a recent email exchange, which I, I know some of you all here uh, engaged in, and I did as well, with Richard Powell, a deacon at the Southwest Church in Austin, who sought to prove that one cannot know when God withdraws fellowship, and therefore we cannot know. Michael Hatcher was one who was involved in this, and, in an, and he's dealt with this in an art, two articles in The Defender, and I would encourage you to read all of that material. But Michael Hatcher stated, your problem is that you are an agnostic. You either do not believe there is an objective truth, or you do not believe that man is able to know that truth. Thus you have to ultimately have elders determine doctrine. They are the ultimate authority in the church, so you said. Even your statements here show you do not believe that truth can be known concerning the others of their error. Thus you wrongly think that there is think, a group of men who you have never stated who they were. Remember the questions that I asked you and never answered? And I asked, asked them the same questions too. Trying to run the church somehow. The fact is those group of men that you imagine are trying to run the church are simply calling men back to the Bible and that objective truth. 
When one leaves that objective truth, they should be given time to repent, or if they fail to repent, then mark and avoid them. That is what we are commanded to do, and also answers the majority of your questions, because it's what God does, and we simply follow his actions and commands in this regard. I don't have time to go on and, and, and deal much with this so-called syllogism that uh, this deacon set forth, but uh, Michael Hatcher deals with it very well. The idea that he was saying we can't know when the lamp is withdrawn, the light is withdrawn according to the book of Revelation. And so we, since we can't know when God removes the candlestick, we couldn't determine who we would have fellowship with God. Isn't it amazing how people will reason in order to do what they want to do? Whether it be the out and out agnostic who says, I can't know whether there's God. Why? Because he wants to do his own thing. To even our brethren who can't... Uh, know whether there is a truly a God or those who say, well, I can't know what God is telling me. I can't understand the truth. I can't know for sure. Therefore, I'm going to do this and that. Brethren, why do we have so many problems in the church today when it comes to the matter of fellowship? The matter is because men are choosing to be agnostic when it comes to the matter of knowing the truth of God's word. Amen. John makes it very clear that we can know. Therefore, we can know who we should fellowship. We don't need a body of elders to tell us that, because the Bible's already told us what the truth is. The Bible's already informed us as to what the doctrine of Christ is. Agnosticism is something that we just must face and deal with it, not only in the world, but out within our own brethren. And if I don't quit, David's going to tell me I don't have the knowledge to know when the time has come to close my mouth. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention this morning. Thank you. Much appreciated is the material that's just been offered and the forces which was offered and the well it was arranged. Deeply appreciate Brother Ken for his labors in the kingdom and his conviction for the truth. The problem with people like Richard Powell, whom I've known longer than anybody else in this room, is that he's ignoramus, period. He chooses to be an ignoramus. He glorifies his ignorance. He thinks everybody else ought to be too. Now, if you think that's being tough on him, you just deal with him, and you'll find out. And not only that, if you use the terminology that Paul used, if they would but speak at Southwest, the leadership, say for his own father, knows it as well as I do. I knew it when I was there. I knew it when I was there. And recently he's proved that age hasn't benefited him at all. Fermented ignorance. There's a lot of folks out there in the church. He's a deacon in the church. Brethren, there's what's killing us. Stand up here and tell the religious world around about us that this is our own rule of faith and practice. And then turn around and allow people in the church who have no more business being what they are than a goat in a cloud of glory. And, and then let that go. And we won't do anything about it. What happens is, if you speak like I'm speaking now, then you're considered harsh, mean, hateful, and whatever. And then they forget about that a few years ago as they challenged the Shelleys and as they spoke against the Lakatos. That side of the fence called them what they're now calling me. Rather than the measure of things is truth. That's all that makes any difference. The measure of things is truth. God's truth. God's word. While we wait for the ladies to come, he mentioned John. Notice there's only two ways that uh, one can come to know anything, and he's made that very clear. John's an apostle. As with the other apostles, notice what he says in 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. 
for this life was manifested and we have seen it. That's empirical knowledge. The apostles had that knowledge. But then notice, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. Now you've got evidence that allows you to come to the same knowledge that the apostles had through empirical, hands-on, sensory knowledge. So I come to know on the basis of contemplation, but I also come to know on the basis of empirical knowledge, sense, evidence. But you know it just as much one way as you do the other. But let me tell you something. If your knowledge concerning God, Christ, and the Bible, all things therein, is not correct, your faith can't be right. And no man's going to go to heaven by an accident. That's the reason that John talks about the Christians, that you're certain. Certainty comes with absolute objective knowledge. Whether I arrive at that in the way John did as an apostle, or whether I arrive at it through contemplation. That's a very important point to keep in mind. All that, this is what's bothered me, one of the things, all of that work that people like Brother Warren did, Brother Deaver too, what's it profited people in the last 15 years? Now Terry's one that had direct contact as much as anybody here with Brother Warren in the training and so forth he did. There are a whole host of others who had that same training. What are they doing? What are they doing with all of that? I know what Brother Warren wanted them to do. I know that he wanted them to be educated in a way to meet the highly educated philosophers and expose them at their own game. I know that. What are they doing? Instead, they're falling right back as if the material given and taught on so long by these good men was never there. I'm doing some work right now. I hope we get finished before a lot of y'all leave. There's going to be a survey. It's going to remind you, Brother Terry, in particular, some of the others, of somebody you knew who had really had a right true false statement. And uh, I hope you'll take that survey and help me out on something. If you don't, I'm just going to go crazy and tell the elders to get somebody else, and I'm going to find a padded cell and retire like they've done at Memphis. <laughs> now, I mean that finally, but Brother Elkins himself says, well, we can't know anything about We can't know about it. I wasn't there to investigate the business out there at uh, what Dave Miller did at Brown Trail. I didn't go see. I wasn't there, so I can't speak to that. Now, that's agnosticism. He had no problem of being able to make some comments about me and my family that he didn't re research at all. And it was very derogatory. No problem at all doing that. And he's done that with a number of the rest of us. And then want somebody to sign and it not, now you can't divulge any of this and try to get it signed several times. All right, uh, Brother Dave? Amen. Yes, sir. Now that's a bunch of malarkey coming from somebody like that. I don't want to get off on that, but it needs to be gotten off and the brotherhood needs to be pressed on it. Somebody says, I'm tired of hearing it. You're not through hearing it. Thank you. I will just give me a chance.